Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, the Kennebec Valley Chamber is pleased to welcome each and every one of you to the Chamber Connection. Today's topic is a legislative debrief and a look ahead from our friends at the Maine State Chamber of Commerce. I am, I am Tim Walton. I'm, uh, I own and operate a government relations and lobby, lobby firm here in Augusta. Uh, I'm also the vice chair of the Kennebec Valley Chamber of Commerce and I chair the Government uh, Relations Advocacy Committee at the Chamber. I would like to thank the Maine State Chamber of Commerce for presenting to us today. We understand this is a busy time of year for you, and we are very grateful for your participation. I also would like to take this opportunity to recognize our event sponsors, Central Maine Power Company and the Kennebec Valley Savings Bank. Um, and um, I would like to I usually wait till the end for this, but just in case I forgot, a big thanks to Iris of our chamber staff, Kennebec Valley, and all the staff there. Um, they, do a, they do a great job with all of these events and uh, prepare us well and uh, very professional. Thank you, Iris. Um, now let me take just a second to interview, uh, introduce the uh, Maine State Chamber staff. Um, I've known all of these people for some time, uh, some longer than others, and work closely with them uh, in my role at the State House. Um, they, uh, I can tell you, they do an exceptional job representing business and industry's uh, interest there, whether it's promoting public policy or making sure we uh, defeat uh, the public policy that isn't in our best interest. So. Um, uh, I will tell you that that's just, uh, we're very lucky to have them uh, leading our team there. Uh, with that said, uh, Dana Connors is the president of the Maine State Chamber. Uh, since 1994, he's held that role. Um, I've served under Dana on the board of directors for a number of years. And um, we, are, uh, we are very lucky to have Dana um, leading the effort there. Um, I'm not gonna read, they, they, they provided us bios. Um, in, in the respective time and uh, people's schedules. I'm not gonna read all the bios, but I'm sure you can access them if you'd like at a later point. Um, Peter Gore is the executive vice president of the chamber and he too has been with the chamber since 1994. I didn't realize that Peter, I, I, I thought you came in a few years after, so I learned something today. Um, he, uh, he is the vice president for advocacy and government relations. He leads the advocacy team um, at the chamber. Linda Caprera, I've probably known Linda the longest out of anybody in her prior roles. Linda has been around the public policy arena for a very long time um, in different uh, roles. And as, as this, she specializes in taxation and is a director of grassroots <coughs> main chamber. Um, uh, Simon West, I probably worked with the least amount of time, but it's, it's been a rewarding experience for me working with Simon. He's a true professional. Um, in addition to uh, the, his role as human resource director, he also um, uh, directs the finance efforts at the chamber. And the, uh, he's the president of the Education Foundation and the president of the Maine Economic Research Institute. You all will commonly known, it was commonly known as uh, Mary. And I think you're gonna hear more about Mary in the, in the upcoming months, so. Uh, and then Ben Lucas, uh, Ben Lucas is the newest member of the advocacy team at the chamber, but he has a long history of advocacy efforts and government relations effort, efforts and political efforts around the state, different roles and capacities. Um, uh, ben is a government relations specialist with the chamber and he specializes, uh, although he wears a few other hats, he specializes in energy and environment issues. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Dana to tee it up for his team. And, uh, and they're gonna to present to us, uh, like I said, a legislative debrief and a look ahead. Dana, welcome. Well, thanks Tim and welcome everybody. Uh, the state chamber is uh, fortunate that uh, we have the re strong relationship that we do with this particular chamber. It's all chambers in the state. We consider them to be uh, a family member, a strong member, and a lot of our success is relevant to, to the relationships that we have. Thank, so thanks, Tim. It's a pleasure to be with everyone this morning, a little different than normal with Zoom, but we have become accustomed to the way of the Zoom in these last uh, couple of years. I also learned something this morning, Tim, when you introduced us, you uh, 
you said that you worked for me. I think it's the other way around, if I remember correctly. I think I worked for the board and you're on the board. So I, uh, I learned something there, but I'm not gonna take it to heart because I know you made, a, you made a mistake when you said that, but I still love you for it. Let's, um, let me begin by giving a, uh, an overview as we see it uh, for the 130th, particularly the second session. And um, then once we do that, we'll ask Simon to give a, a preview of what we expect with an initiative that we started several years ago. It kind of, um, it kind of went into dormancy, if you will. And to his credit, Simon has pulled that out of the ashes. And we look forward to this fall of having a real role to play previous to our elections. But let me begin uh, by stating that thanks again for inviting us into your home or your office, wherever we're zooming uh, into your place. But let, let me begin by saying nine days ago, on May the 9th, later in the day, around 6 or 6.30, when the legislature coined these words, adjourned sign die, the second session of the 130th came to a close. That in fact was the veto day that we've all been accustomed to and probably you have as well living in the capital city, but it's, it's the time when things tend to wrap up. Um, but I think as we look back on the 130th, the first session, as well as the second session, it is clear that history will rate that as the pandemic biennium, because in fact, that's exactly what we've struggled with as we have pursued uh, the process of, of making laws in the state of Maine. So let's begin with the ninth. Um, that was veto day. And while we look at the first session, admittedly in the first session, because it goes to June and not April, you would expect more bills, 17, 1800 bills. In a shorter session, it's like 600 bills and we get through on April the 15th. Um, and so you'd expect that there'd be more bills, more activity and even more vetoes. In fact, that was the case. Uh, in our first session, there were 22 vetoes. In the second session, the one we just concluded, as I mentioned on, on May the 9th, there were five. And I think that's indicative of less bills. It's indicative of a shorter time period. It's April 15th, not June 15th. But it's also reflective, in our opinion, that the administration was more aggressive in the second term. The staff was, was worked harder to make sure things were fixed, so to speak, before they landed on the governor's desk. And you also notice that in this past session, there were a lot of bills that were recalled. They got to the governor's desk, but they were recalled by the legislature, I'm sure in her urging, to either modify it or change it in some way to satisfy the governor. So that was, even though we expected there to be some other activity, because you know that until that adjourned sign die is reported, then anything can happen while they're in session. But in truth, the ninth was really, really focused on those uh, vetoes. But there's two other dates that I would suggest that we take a look at. In the short session, it's anticipated that we'd get through on the middle of April. And so this time it was set for the 20th. And remarkably, knowing that the legislature as a full body met very sporadically up until the last couple of weeks of the session in which the norm was more the expression. In other words, when we were able to go into the Capitol, both bodies were back. And so you, you had that access that you didn't have in, in the months preceding that because it, when if the legislature was in session and it was more rare than not, then it, you were limited in access. But in spite of that, and in spite of what, what ended up being 600 bills, which is the normal for or approximate number, uh, you'd call it normal in the short session, 300 of those were carried forward from the first year and 300 were added as a result of activity or acceptability, I should say, by the Legislative Council, the leadership. So on the 20th, 
the date that they said we're going to adjourn, they came very close in spite of not meeting as regularly as they, they normally would. And they only adjourned at one, I, I moved at one day, not adjourned. They only moved at one day in order to accommodate things. So that's pretty remarkable. And then on the 25th, they came back because there were, as customarily the case, a lot of bills are passed that have fiscal notes that aren't in the budget and they have to be accepted or rejected. And how much they accept or reject depends on how much money is available for them. This time there were 200 bills representing about a billion dollars and they were given 12 million to satisfy the need. So each caucus, the Democrats in the House and Senate and Republicans in the House and Senate were each given 3 million to come up with the answer to that $1 billion proposition. So that, in addition to that, there were three or four bills that, that you saw activity uh, during the 25th, the day of the appropriation table items. And those were like uh, the accountability bill that Ben will speak to, uh, also the uh, Good Samaritan bill. Uh, uh, and so you had three or four of those, but for the most part, it was limited and uh, essentially directed to the appropriations table. So that was, those are the three dates that kind of structured this session. So let me expand a little bit more on this, the, the real culture of the second session, which is it is classified as an emergency uh, effort. In other words, it's you. This short session is used to make adjustments to what may have happened or didn't happen in the first session. For example, it's customary in the second session, uh, the short session, to have a supplemental budget. Normally, it's not like this year. This year, there were extra dollars. Sales taxes were strong. We also had some federal dollars, as you remember. So the, the appropriations got together to sort out how they were going to spend it versus how much they were gonna cut. Uh, at the same time, bills that are allowed in, the 300 that I referenced by, by leadership, the, letter, the uh, leaders, legislative council, was really supposed to be emergency bills. But emergency is like beauty, I guess, it's in the eyes of the beholder. So in addition to carryover bills, in addition to emergency bills, uh, supplemental budget, if there's a study or a, a committee that's done work between the first and second, that's accounted for too. But having said all of that, um, while it was shorter session than the first one, while it was clearly um, a more normal number of bills, I think we ought to all agree that the substance of those bills were significant. They were very challenging. And you're gonna find out when, when I refer, defer to the team to talk about those policy issues, exactly what I mean. So when we looked at the session, there was a policy challenge that we had to confront, uh, but there was also a, a, a process issue that we needed to address. So when I say process, I'm really speaking of the influence of the pandemic because all of us, Tim and all the rest of us who were, asked to testify before committees were restricted to Zoom, to virtual presentations. And if you lived where I came from in Prescott and grew up in Easton, that would work very well for you because if it were anything but that process, you'd come to Augusta, it'd take probably a whole day by the time you came and went home, you'd come to Augusta, you would testify, sometimes you'd be limited to three minutes and you weren't sure when you were gonna testify and then you'd have to drive back home. So for those people who testified from distances away, it was, it was really accommodating. But for us, um, people like Tim or ourselves or anybody that is lobbying, that personal connection, that relationship that we need where trust is built and you can talk with somebody in the hallway and present them your side of the issue is really pretty instru instrumental in our success. Um, and so that was a challenge. I think that the Zoom uh, for purposes of testifying before committees will probably be with us and there's no reason why it shouldn't, but it has to be hybrid because we have to get into, or we should be able to get into the halls of the legislature to do our work. The other thing that we found this year that was 
uh, out of the ordinary. Um, and while they modified, it could have been a reflection of the pandemic. It could have been a reflection of the process itself. And um, I don't think it was intended as much, but it became, it became a challenge for us. And that was a number of times um, you would have a title of a bill. It could be a concept with only a title, but no language. And you wouldn't get that language until perhaps a day before the hearing, not giving you ample time. Worse yet, it could be that in work sessions with the legislature themselves deliberate uh, amongst each other and try to find a position uh, that they can support or oppose that we're not, we don't participate in that unless we're asked to. And sometimes in this session, an amendment that would be offered in work session, you also receive the day of the session or the day before. Now we have a leadership summit at Sunday River a year with our board and legislators. And we brought this to our attention and yes, they made some progress, but it still remained a challenge throughout the session. So again, I'm, I'm probably overemphasizing some of the challenges, but the challenges were real, both in policy and process. But I can say um, that as we approach the policy issues, you're gonna hear some very challenging issues that the team's gonna to present to you. But at the end of the day, we're pretty pleased with the outcome. Peter? Thank you, Dana. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Ben and Linda in a minute, um, but I will say this um, as a follow-up to what Dana said, because he, he uh, packaged up the legislative session and the challenges pretty clearly. It, it comes as no surprise, and most of us do this, that the most difficult choices we have to make are often put off to the last minute. And the legislature is no exception in this area. So many of the bills you're gonna hear us talk about have been around for two years. They were introduced in the first legislative session and they were carryover bills. So this, they were the stickiest public policy issues for the legislature to deal with. And so they put it off until the last minute. Um, and as a consequence to that, um, I think some of the major issues that Ben, Linda, and I all have are end, going to end up being revisited in the next legislative session. Um, things were done, they were done quickly. Um, and in some cases, they were done incomplete or without having a full picture of what the impact of passing certain pieces of legislation will have on the state, on certain businesses and the economy as a whole. So I think we'll be revisiting some of the more important issues in the 131st. Uh, and, and, and it's disconcerting in some ways because you want public policy to be complete and done, and it just doesn't always work that way. So I'm going to hand it off to Ben to start to talk about his issues, and we'll go to Linda, and then I'll finish up, and we'll have a presentation from Simon. Thanks, Peter. <clears throat> uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here with you today. Um, as you heard earlier, I cover uh, two committees that I, I primarily focus on for the chamber. Uh, the first is the Energy Utilities Technology Committee, and the second is Environment and Natural Resources. Uh, it was a very busy session in both of those committees. Uh, the Energy Committee had about 25 bills in total that they had to work through in a three month period. And the Environment Committee had another 12 or, or 13 or so that they had to work through. Um, so I'm gonna go through some of them. I wanna start first by highlighting uh, three priority pieces of legislation that the Chamber was opposed to and were defeated, um, which is a, a positive outcome for the business community. Uh, the first one is LD 489. Uh, this would have proposed a constitutional amendment um, in Maine to establish the right to a healthy environment. The second one is LD 1532, an act to protect Maine's air quality by strengthening requirements for air emissions licensing. And the third one I want to highlight is LD 1634, an act to create the Maine Generation Authority. Uh, looking at some legislation that did pass this session that I think is, uh, you know, generally speaking of concern to, to all businesses or, or should be on all businesses radar in Maine. Uh, the first is LD uh, 1894. Uh, this is around broadband. It's an act to support municipal broadband infrastructure through incentives and competition. Uh, what this bill seek to do is, is help clear and pave the way for um, municipal owned, government owned broadband networks. Um, we, we testified in opposition, raising some concerns that there was no language to protect against the overbuilding of uh, existing infrastructure in place, no guardrails to protect against some of our federal funding, um, et cetera. 
Uh, it would al allow any local water or utility district to, to pretty much submit a, a grant proposal for, for broadband. Uh, the Energy Committee did make improvements to this bill through the legislative process. What ended up passing was a local water or utility district first must register with the PUC before owning and operating a broadband network. And if the PUC, the Public Utilities Commission, determines that they can, they must then amend their local utility charter, which is subject to legislative approval and would go through the public hearing process in the Energy Utilities Technology Committee. Uh, so it made, a, it made improvements to the bill. Uh, I think, I don't think it's perfect. Um, you know, the chamber always and, and will continue to have concerns about municipal government owned networks. Uh, we've been very consistent with that position. We would prefer to see public private partnerships working with the municipalities to, to deliver high speed broadband to all main residents by 2024, which is a goal of Governor Mills, rather than having open competition between uh, you know, the existing infrastructure that's in place uh, and a new municipal owned, government owned network. Um, so that's the first bill. The second one that I want to touch base on is LD 1911. Uh, this was an act to prohibit the contamination of clean soils with so-called well, forever chemicals. Uh, this is around the conversation of PFAS. Um, what this bill seeks to do is, uh, and what this bill will do is it will prohibit the land application or sale of sludge or sludge derived compost that comes from a municipal, industrial or commercial wastewater treatment facility. Uh, there were some exemptions that were made to, to some of those entities, such as uh, food waste processing, um, you know, lime mud that comes from our land mill, uh, you know, our, our, um, the, the paper mills, um, and, you know, some malt liquor, breweries, um, et cetera. Um, you know, the, the hope of this was to prohibit our lands from being contaminated with PFAS. At first form, there were testing requirements that were implemented. Uh, through the committee process, the testing requirements were, were dropped, um, and it just was an all-out ban on that, uh, you know, on the, the sludge coming from municipalities or, or other entities. Um, you know, I, I think some of the concerns that lie with that is it, it's going to require all of this additional sludge to now be landfilled, and we just simply don't have the landfill capacity in the state of Maine. And that's going to increase costs on uh, municipal ratepayers at various, you know, water water districts. Um, you know, we've heard from some municipalities that this is this being passed is going to, you know, cause a three hundred thousand dollar increase on their budget. Uh, we already know that um, you know individuals in Maine are dealing with you know record high electric bills, utility bills, cost of living has gone up. Um, you know, so that so that's a real concern. Um, I will say more generally speaking, when talking about PFAS. Um, you know, this is a new issue. It's emotionally charged. We certainly understand both sides of it. You've heard from folks who have, uh, you know, had financial losses from their land being contaminated, um, health impacts, et cetera. Uh, it's emotionally charged, um, but I will say it's important for the chamber and the business community to be engaged on the topic of PFAS, because as we learn more and as we look ahead to the 131st legislature, there's gonna be more legislation around PFAS. And the more we learn about PFAS, we're gonna find out it's in a pretty much every product, uh, every material, a, a lot of things. Um, so as, as they look to address this you know, crisis on a public policy front, it's, it's gonna be, it's gonna really change the way our businesses can operate and compete in a global economy. Uh, and, and we feel it's important to, to be able to en engage in that discussion. Uh, again, you know, finding that common ground between the emotional stories that you hear of folks who have been impacted uh, and allowing our businesses to still be competitive and, and operate and manufacture and uh, produce goods. Um, 1950, LD 1959, this is regarding utility accountability. Um, what this bill is, is aiming to do is uh, institute performance standards for our two transmission distribution utilities, uh, Central Maine Power and Versant Power, if you live in the Northern parts of the state. Um, it wants the utilities in, in original form to submit a report card every quarter. Um, if they do not meet those standards after two consecutive quarters in original form, they would have been imposed a $1 million fine. Uh, the chamber raised concerns about that. We felt that two quarters wasn't a long enough period for the utilities to submit a report card and be graded on that. Uh, we live in Maine. 
you know, we have a lot of snow, we have a lot of wind, uh, the climate is rapidly changing. It's, it's a really, really hard place for uh, utilities to operate. And we felt that a full year would be, um, you know, a, a better accurate gauge of, of grading the utilities. Uh, and so that was an improvement to the bill. Again, still some concerns um, about the cost that it could pass along to ratepayers, but uh, an improvement from, from original form and, and a really collective effort uh, by, you know, the governor's energy office, the public utilities commission, the public advocate, uh, the chamber, the utilities. Um, I think a lot of folks worked really, really hard on this bill uh, to try and make it as, as good as it possibly could be and, and make improvements through the committee process. Obviously, this is a very politically charged issue when you're talking about accountability and, and regulatory reform. Um, and, and again, it, it's been a conversation in the legislature for, for several years. Um, two final bills that I want to touch on quickly before I turn it over to Linda for, um, for her to give an update on some tax issues. LD 1969, uh, this is dealing with the renewable energy projects and workforce development. This bill will require the Public Utilities Commission during a procurement process for new renewable projects over two megawatts to evaluate whether a project labor agreement is in the best interest of that pro project. Um, we, we oppose this. We uh, it passed the legislature. We signed on to a, a, a veto letter to the governor um, with a number of other business associations and coalitions. Um, ultimately, it became law without the governor's signature. Um, we feel this legislation is problematic because it will hurt mean based contractors uh, and employees from bidding on those projects or potentially getting those awards. Uh, and it also makes the projects more expensive. Uh, which again will get passed along to ratepayers at a time when most ratepayers in Maine are seeing a 89%, you know, 81% increase on their um, their electric bills. Um, and the last one to to sort of end on a more positive note, and this was a, a collective team effort here at the chamber, as it wasn't a um, a a you know energy environmental aimed bill. It was really more workforce related, and that was LD 2003, the spe uh, Speaker Fecto's housing bill which uh, seeks to update and modernize some uh, zoning regulations uh, to be able to easy, more easily build new affordable housing in Maine. Uh, we supported this bill uh, along with a, a wide group of other entities. Um, you know, I don't think it's, it's gonna solve the whole housing crisis in Maine, but it's a great starting point in you know, updating you know, out-of-date zoning regulations uh, to reach the demand and, and, and help uh, me be able to attract more people to live here is is crucial. I, I think I saw uh, Representative La Rochelle on this call a little earlier. Um, I, I know she worked very hard on getting this passed. Senator Pouliot uh, of the Augusta area worked very hard on on getting this passed. Uh, and I know uh, Senator Craig Hickman from out in uh, the the Reedfield area was a was a co-sponsor of this bill as well. So it was a bipartisan vote. Uh, we were happy to see it passed. Uh, there was a lot of tension around this. Um, but a positive, positive outcome um, to, to, a, to, to start to address the housing crisis in Maine. Um, and, and that kind of sums up my issues. I will uh, turn it over to Linda now to give us her update on uh, the tax committee, which is always fun. Oh, yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Tim said, I handle tax issues and appropriations issues for the state chamber. Uh, we had a, we had our hands full the last couple of years. I will say there's an enormous amount of anti-business legislation in the area of taxation um, and we, some of it was carried over to this session, and I'll talk about that. I kind of want to talk about three bills that were defeated this year. One was the notorious camp tax bill. This was LD 1337. I can't imagine someone would put this bill forth in the state of Maine, but they did. Um, and basically, that would have allowed municipalities through an ordinance to enact an impact fee. They didn't say how much the impact fee could have been on second homes in Maine. We defeated it. Um, I just can't even believe someone would put that forth, but they did. That was a first. Um, LD 1289, this bill is Joe Perry's bill out of Bangor. This is one of nine income tax bills um, that basically would have increased the income tax rates here in the state, the top rates. And basically what this would have done is increase it from 7.15 to 7.95. And as you know, the legislature of the last, you know, since 2015 or 16 has reduced those rates. So this would, would have gone backwards. We defeated that one as well. LD 1704 was Rachel Talbot Ross's bill. This was a, a second estate tax bill that we dealt with. 
And this would have lowered the threshold from the current 5.7 to $1 million, making more of Mainers estates taxable. We're able to defeat that one. Some of the bills that passed um, that you would want to know about. Um, one is the supplemental budget. It was a $1.2 billion budget. It passed by a huge margin in the state, the House and Senate, by a par bipartisan effort on both sides. In the House, it passed 119 to 16. In the Senate, 32 to 2, which was huge. It did a lot for Mainers in the state. Um, what, what it does is basically in June, you will start hopefully receiving $850 checks for over 800,000 Mainers. That's huge. It will provide $20 million for free community college education for high school students that are eligible that graduate between 2020 and 2023. It's gonna provide $100 million in transportation money. It has $30 million in there for to keep education at the 55% level. It's got $12 million in there for to increase pay for uh, workers who work in childcare. Um, and as we know, that's a big workforce issue. Um, also $8 million to keep um, the tuition flat at the University of Maine. So it does a lot, um, that bill. Um, that's LD 1995. LD 428, which is the perennial tax haven issue. The bill would have required main companies who operate in certain jurisdictions around the world to include their income in their main income, which would be double taxation. So they gutted that bill. They realized the governor wasn't going to sign it. So they basically came up with a study that they're directing MRS to main revenue services to do. And basically all that's going to do is study what if Maine were moved to worldwide reporting, which is basically including in Maine income, income regardless of where it's earned, both domestic and foreign. So that's a study. LD 2030 basically will provide a sales tax reimbursement for sales of commercial energy storage facilities. This is a new sales tax reimbursement. Um, this is a new industry. As you know, we have a lot of renewables here in the state. This basically will provide that way, way of storing that en energy, which is really what we want to do here in Maine and attract that type of industry. So that's a hugely positive thing. Um, LD 1129 was not so positive. This is the dark source bill. This is really going to change the way um, assessors value property, unfortunately. Um, what this will do is prohibit assessors from considering deed restrictions, zoning restrictions, or encumbrances with valuing property with no similar restrictions. So it really changes the way things are valued. Um, we are going to put this in a bill in to reverse this next year. <laughs> that is what Dana was talking about earlier. We are going to do that. Um, just not what you want to do. You don't want to tie the hands of an assessor in valuing their property. They, he or she should be able to use his or her own judgment. So that's unfortunate. But um, that was one. Now, the 1156, this is Amy Arata's bill. This is basically going to take in ta um, employment in increment tax financing and basically base it on um, growth wages rather than withholding. Currently, businesses get a percentage of withholding back if they fall under, the, if they take this program, if they create more than five jobs. So basically, it just simplifies how the pro program's calculated. Main Revenue Services said it's not going to result in any huge tax increases. It's really going to be a wash across the board. So we monitored it and we just, you know, we're, we're supporting it. So, and I think that's it for um, legislation. There's a lot more that we followed. We followed an enormous amount of concept drafts, uh, department bills. You never know what they're going to slip in there. But the state's in a really good position right now financially. Um, they've got over a half a billion dollars in the rainy day fund. So, and sales tax revenue keeps coming in. I think what they're predicting, it's going to come in a little bit slower. But really, when folks were home, they spent money. <laughs> online. So that's why we have such a strong economy here in terms of, you know, having, we, we didn't have to cut, which was good. And I will want to say, put a plug in for the governor, um, because, you know, it, a lot of this anti-tax legislation that we saw the last couple of years, things would have been different had she not stepped up and said, we're not, I'm not signing any new, new, new bills that have new taxes associated with them. So I just want to say that. So Peter, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Linda and Ben. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of uh, labor bills, a healthcare bill, and I'll call it a miscellaneous bill um, that I followed in the closing days of the session. As was indicated earlier, I had a number of carryovers in the Labor Committee. So the first one was 225, 
That's a bill that deals with the cash out of unused vacation time when an employee leaves an employer's employment. Maine already has a law in place which indicates that an employer is required to cash out somebody's vacation pay if they have such a policy in their handbook or it's an employment policy. Those, that unused time is the same status as wages earned. This bill applies to any employer with more than 10 employees who perhaps didn't have that policy in place. And it will require them to cash out unused vacation time. That doesn't mean they can't cap the amount of time they give someone. That doesn't mean they can't cap accrual. It doesn't mean they can move to a PTO time and be exempted from this law. It doesn't mean that um, they can't institute or use it or lose it policy. And this does not apply to earned paid leave. So, and the other thing too is this perspective. Um, it's only to time accrued after 1123. I, I really don't think overall it's going to have a major impact on businesses in the state, but it is a change that employers should be aware and account to it. Perhaps our highest priority bill in this session was again a carryover LD 607. And this deal, bill deals with um, the dividing line, the, the monetary dividing line between an hourly and a salaried employee. And therefore, um, for an hourly employee, would be eligible for overtime. In Maine, that's tied to the minimum wage. It's a multiplier times, the, times whatever the state's minimum wage is. In this case, it's 3,000 times. The bill proposed to tinker with that multiplier and move it up to 45,000, uh, 4,500, excuse me, um, which would move our, uh, our salary threshold from the current 38,250 to above $60,000 a year, giving us the highest threshold in the country. Um, we strongly oppose this. It would have been very expensive for businesses. It would have been very disruptive for the workplace. Um, it's, it's poor for morale for those employees who were on a salary track and now find themselves back to an hourly situation. Um, we opposed the bill. We had a vigorous grassroots effort. Thanks to your members and our members, we were able to convince the legislature to adopt a resolve, which instead would direct the Department of Labor to um, work, uh, enter into a education and outreach effort with the business community to make sure businesses understand why it's so important that they have clear and defined understanding of what constitutes a salary employee versus an hourly employee. The other bill that was passed in literally the last hours of the legislative session was 965. That's a bill that deals with the use of non-disclosure agreements when settling workplace discrimination cases. Um, it's a convoluted bill that's been around for literally four years. It was recalled twice from the governor's desk in this session. Um, at the end of the day, um, I'm not sure it'll have a major impact on the workplace, but it is likely to do two things. It's likely to disincentivize um, either side, a victim or an employer, from settling a discrimination case because that um, each side looks for something monetary versus some kind of um, assurance of confidentiality, and this bill interferes with that. Um, I think that that means that it will take longer to settle discrimination cases, and it's probably going to be more expensive as well. We'll have to wait and see. Um, the other bill and issue I want to touch on is uh, 1952, which was actually a resolve to extend the work of this commission to study paid family medical leave in Maine. Some of you may be aware the commission has been meeting since um, the, the, the fall, last fall and through the winter to look at the issue of setting up a paid family medical leave program in Maine. Um, and they have had some money and they've contracted with an actuary because you were essentially setting up a long-term, short-term disability insurance plan in the state to find out how to do it, how much it would cost, benefit structure, uptake, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't finish their work in time. It's not surprising. And, and to their credit, they didn't rush it. They instead decided that they needed to have more time to gather all their information, the resolve extend this time for them to meet through the remainder of this year and to bring back legislation in January of 2023. I tell you all this because this issue was not going to go away. If the legislature doesn't deal with it, there are public advocacy groups that are gathering signatures that are prepared to put this issue on the ballot. Um, so the issue of having paid leave in Maine um, is a real one. I think employers need to start having a discussion about what that's going to look like and what they can live with. 
Um, I know as an organization, we have been I'm talking with our members and those are still ongoing, but expect the bill on this in January of 2023. The healthcare bill is LD19, uh, excuse me, LD 1945. This is a bill um, that deals with providing access to fertility care. It's what's known as a health insurance mandate. It means and then any individual, any policy that impacts an individual, a small group or a large group must offer this coverage. It's not optional. Um, and it's the most expensive health insurance mandate that's been proposed and adopted in two decades in this state. It provides pretty much unfettered access to fertility care and treatment. Again, very emotionally, uh, very emotionally compelling. Uh, this was a tough uh, mandate for folks not to vote against despite the, the, the expense of it. It may be as much as five to six dollars per member per month in new health insurance premium going forward. It's effective next year on all those policies as I mentioned. Um, the, the last minute, the, the legislature did try to put some limitations on uh, on the bill in terms of what the carriers might be able to adopt to try and minimize the cost. But no one knows what the impact of those guardrails will really be um, on the premium going forward. So that's a health insurance bill. Um, the last bill I wanna talk about is um, a bill that came up at the end of the legislative session. I'm sorry, this is 1945. The other bill was 19, 1539. 1945 is a bill that deals with the protection of biometric information. So that's your fingerprint to unlock your phone, your facial recognition on your phone, um, making a phone call and having voice recognition um, to pay a bill or even in your bar. Illinois passed a law in 2008 and folks here tried to emulate that law. It would put very significant restrictions on the use of uh, biometric information under the, under the uh, misnomer of protections. Um, and it tied to that um, extensive litigation and private rights of action that has made it a, the law a disaster in Illinois. Um, so much so that there are no biometric protections and they have, those protections are very real for individuals and people rely on them, whether you're using it in an app to pay a bill, banking, protect access to your phone. In Illinois, for example, if you buy a Subaru, there is no voice recognition technology. It's been removed because of the threat of um, litigation, because just like in Illinois, in Maine, the proposal was you had to have consumers opt in every single year. And if you miss even one consumer, you have litigation on your hands. Um, it was a convoluted process, complicated bill. It was rushed. The bill was incomplete. And proponents of the bill wanted to pass it regardless, um, but give it a delayed implementation date of 1-1-24, um, and then establish a study committee to meet throughout now between the end of session in January to come back to fix the bill that they had passed and delay the implementation of. Um, we say that's a bad idea. That's not how you make good public policy. If you have an issue, you study it first, and then you come back and you create a law. If you find that, if the study finds that it's necessary, um, the, the, set, the House wanted to pass the bill and then study it and then come back and fix it. The Senate wanted to study the bill and then decide if they needed to have a law. The two sides couldn't agree and the bill died in non-concurrence. That means this issue is coming back in 2023 for certain. Um, it is an important issue and, it, and, and uh, consumers should expect that businesses will protect their uh, biometric information. They already do, but people are gonna want access to this information going forward. So those are those, I think that completes our presentation, Dana, um, in yep. terms of policy stuff. We yep. can take questions. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Peter, and thanks to the team. Um, that was a comprehensive review. Um, I, I, I wanna close it out before we turn it to Simon to acknowledge the fact that in the legislative process, uh, there are two sides to the legislature or two sides to the legislative issues within a legislative session. One that gets most of the attention are the very issues that we've talked about, which are the challenges, the barriers that stand in the way of progress uh, for the state, uh, at least from our opinion. And you've heard about those, but there's always some good, some opportunities um, that come out of a session that always get less attention, uh, but they're nevertheless deserving of being um, pointed out. 
And such was the case here. Uh, clearly, Linda mentioned that in the supplemental budget, and I also referenced this, that while normally in the second session, you're going to, well, almost predictably, you're going to see a supplemental budget be presented to the Appropriations Committee and finally to the legislature, but it's usually to cut things out because revenues didn't come in as expected. This time around, because the sales tax being strong, as she mentioned, and also because of the federal funds in the form of infrastructure or the America's Rescue Plan that the governor put forward and, and called it the main jobs and recovery plan, that there were additional dollars. And the significance is what she said. Not only were there some good things in that, but it was passed unanimously by the committee, a bipartisan message to the rest of the legislature. And that was good. That that really sends a signal that most people like to see, which is coming together and making decisions, listening to other to each other and, and uh, coming up with a common result. The, the other thing that didn't get, it got some attention and you're gonna read more about it in the future is the main spaceport that was really the effort to establish this new initiative located in uh, Brunswick Landing over the Brunswick area, also Loring Air Force Base in Aristic County in the mid coast. And it takes those miniature satellites and in a, in a world where innovation is so important, uh, it clearly is an expression of innovation because that will be a learning uh, for our younger people. It'll provide uh, data and that type of information and it's, it's kind of an exciting uh, opportunity to put Maine on the map once again. Um, the other was what I mentioned. There was a lot of dollars that came in that met a lot of needs. Uh, Pete and Linda, and I think Ben as well, all referenced to something that, that we, I'm speaking of studies. And studies can be a way to defer things by a legislature because they either don't want to make the decision or they can't make the decision, whatever the case may be but there's real legitimacy for studies. And there were three or four examples that were mentioned by the team in which you can get ahead of yourself. It's like the old saying goes, ready, ready, aim, fire, which is the right expression. Oftentimes without the study, it's ready, fire, aim. And there are issues and they spoke of some, whether it's PFAS, whether it's biometric, whether it was uh, what Linda had referenced a couple that you really need to sit down and better understand both the issue, the impact, and the good that can come out of it, and then make that decision. And uh, we, you know, we don't, if it's put off for purposes of undeciding, that's one thing. But if it's really to understand the issue, that's a very good thing. And the other thing I'll speak to very briefly is, is to really put a uh, to uh, do a shout out for Maine's 10 year strategic plan. In 2019, before any of us knew that the pandemic was going to change our lives and, in some instances, our livelihood in the next two years and possibly beyond, um, that plan was put in place. And it was the two principal issues was workforce that we all know is a major challenge. And the other was innovation, which is not as well understood in its imperative, but it's clearly an imperative. And that is it's new ways, new products, new ideas, using technology, which we all know is part of it. But it also said that to make workforce and technology uh, to satisfy the, the need to address those issues, you need to make some key investments. Well, what were those investments? Broadband, childcare, housing, transportation. And that became a centerpiece of what was proposed in this legislature, what we need, what we have experienced and know that there has to be answers to. So that the, the, those were some of the things that came out that were very, very positive in our opinion that speaks to the other side, or as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. Um, so that's kind of a wrap up for this session. The only thing that I, I would close on is two points. Number one is the pandemic has taught us more than ever. We've always believed in it, but boy, the pandemic put it front and center. And that is um, the strength is always in the team. And our success, in my opinion, had a lot to do with the ability of the advocacy team, their experience, their skill, their relationships, but also because of the relationships and the support we had from local and regional chambers in particular. Um, 
when we reach out either through an action alert or through a coalition form and you reach out to your legislator, that intimacy that's represented between you and your legislator at a local level is very powerful. Legislators do not get a lot of comments, um, but when they do, they listen. Um, and so thanks for that. I, this would be my final comment in that a speaker of the house several years ago when we were focused or I was focused on behalf of the chamber on issues and probably complaining a bit to that person about the number of bills that get put in, the message it sends and so forth. She said to me, um, Dana, don't judge us by what gets presented. Judge us by what gets passed. And, and that's very valid because it, every legislator that goes there goes there with good purpose, good meaning, and I, I don't criticize them for their efforts. They may not be the same as ours. They may be far more conservative, more likely far more liberal as we've seen in this biennium. But the truth of the matter is they believe in what they're doing can't fault them for that. We don't have to agree to that, but the process is there to try to modify it. So uh, my hat's off to those who are willing to serve because it's not an easy task and we all respect the right that they have. But the key is what we've learned. When you come together, stay together and work together, as we've seen, um, what gets passed really matters more than what gets presented. So I'm going to stop there for the moment. I'm going to turn it over to the initiative that we mentioned at the very outset, which is the Maine Economic Research Institute. It was in existence some time ago. It kind of went into a lull period. Simon West, I give him a lot of credit, has brought that back to life. It's incredibly significant as we approach the selection season. And Simon, you can tell them why. Thank you, Dana, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. Um, as Tim introduced me earlier, I lead the HR and finance functions for the Maine State Chamber. And um, as part of the exciting work I get to do here, I serve as the president of the Maine Economic Research Institute. And I have a brief presentation I'd like to show to illustrate some of the work we do. So I'm gonna initiate a screen share here and um, go through that. And hopefully I can get it to, okay, here we go. Oh, I'm sorry, let me try this again. There, that's a bit more of where I wanted it. So the Maine Economic Research Institute, for those of us on the call unfamiliar with it, um, I like to present it with a situation we are all familiar with. Roughly 18 months ago, uh, we were in a situation where we meet, needed to make a decision about who we wanted to send to the state capitol to represent us in the 130th legislature. Fast forward to today, the legislature is over and in about six months, we're gonna be faced with that same decision. And for many of us, it will be a decision against incumbents and challengers who would like to unseat them. And we all have our own process for making that decision, whether it is looking at what, what party uh, the candidates are aligned with and are we aligned with that, looking at campaign materials, talking with uh, friends, colleagues, and relatives. And of course, we like to know the performance of how candidates did, but that information can be some of the hardest to get to. Um, what legislation did they sponsor? What kind of language did they contribute to different bills? How did they vote on certain issues? And of course, how did their actions compare to their campaign promises? And that's really where Mary comes in. It's the only organization in Maine that holds legislators accountable for how they treated industry and economic issues. And we do that with two main publications that we circulate. Uh, the first is our watch list. This here is a peek at the watch list and the body responsible for putting this together is Mary's advisory committee. The committee is made up of representatives from many main industries, hospitality, retail, healthcare, financial services, and forestry are just to name a few. 
the watch list begins in the first session of a legislature and is built as soon as bills are printed and put to different committees. And it the advisory committee meets on a monthly basis while the legislature is in session and it grows during the first and second sessions. We have it broken down into different uh, types of bills here, healthcare, hospitality, labor, you see a lot of taxation bills. And on the watch list, we categorize the LD number, the title, and who the bill sponsor is. Every time that legislation is added to this watch list, we distribute it to the legislature so they can see what is important to us. It goes out to chamber members and it goes onto the website to go to the public as large so that we can circulate it. Once the legislature has completed and the legislators go home to begin their campaign season, the advisory committee then sits down and looks at this list and looks at what bills on it have made it all the way through the legislative session so that it can be rated. That next publication is called our roll call rating. This document has different economic indicators on it that show Maine against the rest of the Northeast as well as the US on things such as educational attainment, fuel cost, taxation rates and so forth. But the heart of it is the rating of legislators. And the next slide is gonna show you what that looks like. I just do wanna say that this next slide is not based on the current legislature, the 130th. We're still working on the rating process that will be available in the next couple of weeks. Um, but this is a brief snapshot of the 129th. And you can see here, this is broken up by, um, this is a picture of the Senate. You have the Senator, the district they're from, their party affiliation the bills that made it through the legislative session, and then the score that they get. Uh, a negative is they voted against Mary's position on a bill, positive, they voted with it. An E is an excused absence. And then if there's an A, that's an absence that wasn't excused. They just weren't there for the vote. And that counts as a negative towards them. Um, the final score comes from two different ways of looking at the legislator. The first is a quantitative, and it is just strictly how they voted. The next is a qualitative, and that is, say a legislator voted for a bill that Mary was against, but during their committee work, they changed the bill to be from something we were extremely against to a bill that we just didn't like. We want to ensure that the legislator gets credit for that work um, because that type of uh, teamwork, compromise, that's how things really get done um, at the Capitol and we want to honor and value that type of work together. Um, aside from this publication here, uh, Mary is also working, as Dana had said, to revitalize itself. Um, one of the changes we're making is the way the advisory committee looks at bills. Instead of specifically just saying that these are industry needs, we're adapting that lens to be directed towards the state strategic plan so that when we look at a bill, we want to see, does this help increase wages without harming businesses? Does this help attract 75,000 workers to the workforce? And does this increase the value of products per worker? One of the other things we want to do is move from just having these two publications to doing presentations for local chamber members. I, I put a presentation together for the mid-main chamber and what we did is we looked specifically at the legislators whose territory also align with the mid-main chambers. And uh, later this summer when all the scores are together and I have this publication, I wanna meet with as many local regional chambers and members as I can to go through that. And briefly, my next slide shows, uh, this again is from uh, information of the 129th and is from the mid-main presentation, um, but it's a senator from District 3, Bradley Farron, shows his party, uh, the territory he represents, the legislative document he sponsored in the 129th, and then his previous Mary score of 91.17. And this is something I would like to duplicate and meet with as many local regional chambers as possible. Uh, the next slide I have, and I'll leave up for just a couple of seconds, 
is my contact information if you want to jot that down and ensure you can get on a mailing list so that when the uh, roll call rating is ready for the 130th, I can get that directly to you without you having uh, to look for it on the website or request it at a later date. And now I will uh, end my screen share and turn it back over to Tim. Thanks, Tim. As I hand it back to you, uh, let me make this uh, comment because it kind of reflects what we've seen this year, but we shouldn't forget about it going forward is that that teamwork, that working together is so fundamental. And please know above all else that uh, we want to be there for you to be a part of that because you've been there for us. And uh, that's the message we leave you with today, but it's a message we hope uh, carries forward in the sessions and the time to come. So Tim, it's all yours, buddy. Thanks, Dana. And uh, thanks to the um, very much to the uh, chamber staff for those presentations. Simon, thanks for uh, um, resurrecting Mary, if you will. It was a great tool in the past, and I'm sure it's going to be in the future. Um, also want to recognize, and I, I apologize to her, I didn't see her on the screen. I think she said she had to step out, but um, she was on the next screen. I forget to scroll over sometimes. But uh, Representative La Rochelle was with us for a good part of the presentations. And for those of you who don't know, um, uh, fine representative from Augusta, she is uh, she took over in the second session in a, uh, uh, to replace a, uh, the rep that uh, left Augusta. And uh, she's done a great job. I will tell you, I've had several interactions with her and um, on client issues and such. And she's very, uh, she uh, listens very well and she responds very well. So if you haven't gotten to know her, please do. Um, and with that, just one more shout out. Uh, my, uh, a lot of my government affairs advocacy team here from the chamber is on, Kenwick Valley Chamber, and want to thank them for all the hard work they did this session. And a special thanks to Cheryl Timberlake, if she's still on. Um, I relied a lot on Cheryl for our advocacy committee meetings this year because as, as most of you on the call know, she, she spends her time over to the state house as well, uh, defending and promoting the issues we all, um, that has our best interest. Um, with that, I do wanna remind uh, everyone that this month's business after hours will take place at the Maine State Credit Union on May 25th. If you haven't registered, please do. Um, I know that uh, the Chamber sent out uh, a few um, notices, so I'm sure you have one in your inbox. And Lindsay would very much like you to, to uh, there's Lindsay right there. She'd like you to uh, register as soon as you can, they, so they can have a good head count. Um, the next women's luncheon will be on June 8th um, at the Augusta Civic Center. Uh, the presentation will be a panel of planning your future self, a discussion on personal finances, estate planning and insurance considerations. Uh, again, um, I'm sure you've got an invite in your inbox. So uh, if you're available and interested, please register as soon as you can. Um, with that, I will, I will say thanks to everyone for participating. And I know we always say this at the Kennebec Valley Chamber, and I know it holds true with the Maine State Chamber. If you ever have any questions of any of the presenters today, reach out, they're there for you, and they'll answer questions as will we at the Kennebec Valley Chamber. So everybody have a great day. Thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on. Bye.